Welcome, everybody. We have another episode of Against the Grain podcast. I'm so excited to have our special guest. But before we do, before I introduce him, uh, make sure you guys uh, like this video, give us a comment down below, and subscribe. We're trying to grow this channel uh, to reach as many people as we can. We have so many amazing videos on this channel. We have worship, we have uh, sermons by pastor, and then more podcasts to come. So I encourage you guys, again, to subscribe and share this video. We have a special guest today, Peter the Jesus. He needs no introduction. I'm so uh, just blessed to have you, Peter, and, and just to um, just to connect with you over all these years. You're just a great friend of ours. Thank um, you. you know, aside from the ministry, you're just a great friend. I remember last year when um, I asked you about making a video for my dad. We did like a surprise mm-hmm. video for him. Right away, you jumped on and you wished him a happy birthday. And, and you know, anytime you come here to California, we love having you. So thank, thank you. you again for being on here. But give us a quick introduction of yourself, of your family. I know you're here with your wife today sure. uh, traveling. But give us a quick introduction just in case anyone that's watching that doesn't know uh, about Peter the Jesus Absolutely. ministry. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Brother Manny. It's an honor to be here on your podcast, Against the Grain. I love that yes. name. Yes, yes. And uh, what an honor to be able to count you and your family, your parents, Pastor Manuel and Pastora Aurora Mm -hmm. Santillano as our family, as our friends, and you all as well and your wonderful church family at Harvest Time. Uh, Mildred and I, we've been married for 25 years. We have our three children, Gabriella, Samantha, and David. Gabriella is recently married, so now we adopted a son in the family, our son-in-law, son-in-love, son-in-the-Lord, Jackson. (laughs) And so um, we live in the greater Dallas, Texas area, and um, we um, are graced by God, Mildred and I, to lead what's called De Jesus Ministries. It's a 501c3 nonprofit Christian evangelistic uh, ministry, and uh, we travel throughout the nation and wherever else the Lord opens doors in Latin America to preach the gospel of Jesus and his kingdom. To do it, amen, to do it in (laughs) English, and I was going to say, y en español. Oh, come on. And so. So, um, and just be able to um, share Jesus and his kingdom Amen. with all of humanity so that all that call upon his name can be saved, can be healed, can be delivered, can receive all every spiritual blessing that is uh, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus available to all through Christ. So uh, that's who we are. That's what we do. And of course, we're on social media, all the different platforms, and uh, we can be found under De Jesus Ministries or Peter uh, De Jesus and Mildred De Jesus. Awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, there, I, I think, for, you know, when, when I first met you, there was just a fire in you. Mm. And I remember when you preached, you know, it was funny. I'll never forget the first time you're kind of preaching and just very, you know, kind of calm and you're yeah. kind of just teaching, teaching. And mm-hmm. then just the fire got turned up to 11. <laughs> and we were just like, this is our type of preaching. Our church Let's is like, go. we love to get crazy and everything. But man, mm. I remember that first service and then it just kept going on and on and on. Yes. Um, but I remember when we first met, when you, you know, we met through an amazing man of God, Elias Flores. That's right, your, uh, he, your brother and friend. Oh yeah, he plugged us in. I got to, I mean, my dad and I were talking. We got to get him mm-hmm. here on the podcast one day. Yes. Um, but he plugged us in, and, and I was sharing with my dad. We did a, our first episode, and mm-hmm. I was sharing with with Pastor. Um, I always say dad, but I got right. I got to remind people that <laughs> Pastor's also my dad. I always say dad, Pastor. I get it mixed right. up. But uh, I, I told I told Pastor I told him uh, it's so amazing that he you know we've only been in ministry for eight or nine years now. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's so amazing that we've been able to connect with so many men and women of God over mm. these years. Um, there's a lot of churches that are very closed, and I think okay. kind of our background, we, you know, when as we grew up in church and everything, mm. we didn't very, we, our church didn't really connect with a lot of other people. But since okay. we've been uh, in, in, in ministry here these last nine years, we've connected with so many people, yourself included, mm. Elias, yes. just amazing men and women of God. Mm-hmm. But um, I know that when, when we first met, you know, you, you, you shared a lot on, on just the importance of Israel. That's right. So I wanted, I wanted to spend some time there because, you know, as we were sharing earlier, you mm-hmm. know, there's a lot of churches that, um, you know, not that maybe they're against Israel, but mm. there, there's no really support. You don't see anything. They're, they're probably not in their prayer life right. or anything like that for Israel or anything. Mm. Give us some of the importance and kind of your background on, 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 on Israel. And sure. Israel. Yeah. Again, thank you again for having me on this wonderful podcast. And let me just say... I thank God uh, for your parents, right? Your pastors, uh, Manuel and Aurora um, Santillano, not only because of who they are in Christ and all they do for his kingdom, especially with the body of Christ, 
also because of their love. Your parents, they get it Mm -hmm. regarding Israel, Mm -hmm. regarding the importance of the body of Jesus Christ being in favor of the nation, of the people of Israel in today's modern times and realizing the importance of the body of Christ, uh, doing all that it can do, not to only spiritually uh, intercede, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as Psalms 122 verse 6 mandates us to, but also understanding that there is blessing in blessing the nation of Israel, according to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God speaking to Abram before he becomes Abraham and saying, uh, I will bless those that bless you. Mm -hmm. I will curse those that curse you. And through you shall all the uh, families or the nations of the world be blessed. And and also understanding the importance of uh, even supporting in some way, shape or form, according to Romans chapter 15, verse 27, where Paul speaks to the Gentile Christian believers in Rome. And he says, if you have benefited from the spiritual inheritance and blessings of the Jewish people, then you owe it to them. In fact, in some Mm. translation, it says it's an obligation of yours to be of material blessing Mm. to them. And I know we're not going to dedicate the entire podcast to what I'm about to say, but if we looked at Luke chapter 7, if we looked at Acts chapter chapter 10, if we looked at other passages of Scripture, both in Old Testament and New Testament Scripture, we would see that when people, whether they were Jew or not, being a Gentile, looked out for the nation of Israel, looked out for the Jewish people, looked out for the land that belongs to Israel, there was blessing in it. Mm -hmm. God our God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our God of Israel, creator of the heavens and the earth, would begin to respond from heaven above to the earth below Mm. to bring breakthrough for people's lives, Mm. whether it was someone needing salvation or receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit like happened in Acts 10 at Cornelius' house, Mm. or whether it was a centurion that had a servant who was sick, such was the case in Luke chapter 7, that needed to receive a supernatural healing. Yes. And the list goes on and on and on. Those that looked out for Israel, those that looked out for the people and even the land would receive a blessing from the God of Israel. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me just pause here and say <laughs> that I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the way in great part that I was introduced to the importance of standing with Israel and in favor of Israel and praying for the peace to Jerusalem and blessing Israel even monetarily was through the great leadership of one of my former pastors, Dr. John Hagee of Cornerstone Church in San Antonio, Texas, where my wife Mildred and I were on staff for a season, serving as the high school youth ministries pastor, then the young adults college and career pastors, and then one of the bilingual pastoral counselors, and then eventually started volunteering for an organization called Christians United for Israel that I eventually became the National Hispanic Outreach Coordinator uh, of and served uh, up until this past May of 2021. And, um, also served as one of the regional coordinators ministering to all ethnic groups regarding the importance of the body of Christ standing with Israel, not because of any political uh, motivation, not because of any ethnic Uh, you know, inspiration, not because of anything that nowadays people have a misconception regarding Israel, Um, especially even within the church, as crazy as that sounds, Mm -hmm. but because of God's word, because of scripture, because of what the Lord has established clearly in his word regarding us standing with Israel. So I'm thankful for Pastor Dr. John Hagee, Diana Hagee, all of the Hagee family, Cornerstone Church, and then of course, Christians United for Israel, that even though we no longer work for them full time, we're still members, we're still even donors, we're Mm -hmm. still uh, congressional liaison as a volunteer for them to help mobilize the body of Christ to stand with Israel now more than ever before, and even influence our government, our nation. Mm -hmm. Again, not because of political reasons, but right. because of a biblical mandate to stand with Israel. Right. Amen. What, what, what's the disconnect that you think, what, what, what has happened as the American church? Where do you think that disconnect is where not so many churches are aware of that? What do you think it is? Wow, that's a great question. And normally, you know, the response would be a 45 minute one. So <laughs> I'm not going to do the 45 minute, but four to five minutes. How about go. that? Right. Yeah. Four hyphen five. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, 
again, I, I would highly recommend people to check out the, uh, the, the resources that Pastor Dr. John Hagee and Christians United for Israel have made available. In fact, a lot of them are free. Mm-hmm. And they're available to the public, both in English and in Spanish at cufi.org. Um, I, I believe that um, the short answer mm-hmm. to what would be worth listening to of the long answer is a combination of several things. Mm-hmm. Um, first and foremost, for Christians specifically, is that... Um, we need to read our Bible more carefully. Mm. We need to read our Bible more carefully. We have to remember that this, the Bible, 66 books, Old Testament and New Testament scriptures together, um, had f- as an estimate, theologians say, of 40 or so writers. Wow. Of those 40 or so writers, only one of them was a non-Jew, a mm. Gentile. That's Luke. He writes the book of Luke right. and the book of Acts. Mm. Outside of that, all of the approximately 40 other writers were Hebrews or Jews. Mm. We have to also remember that the um, individuals in Scripture that we all enjoy, right, reading about, studying about, uh, we uh, receive principles from their lives, right, their narratives, their trajectory, and we apply to our lives. When you consider the patriarchs, when you consider, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when you consider uh, then the um, judges, when you consider the prophets, when you consider the psalmists, when you consider the kings, right? This is all told Old Testament scripture um, reference to influencers, to leaders. Right. When you consider in the New Testament, the disciples of Jesus Christ who become apostles. When you consider Jesus Christ mm. himself, right? right? The right. Messiah, the anointed one, mm-hmm. the appointed one, the only begotten son of God, all of them right. were Jews. Wow. Yeah. Every single one of them. Mm. So I say that because we have a lens as non-Jews that we are, right. even though some of us might have some Jewish blood running through <laughs> our veins, especially us Latinos or yeah. Hispanos, right? And that's connected to the Spanish Inquisition of 1492, when I won't get into the detail of that. Mm. Uh, but being Gentiles, if we're not careful, um, I wear glasses, I'm not wearing them now, right? Mm. But um, if we're not careful, we put on these lenses mm. to read the scriptures, to study the scriptures, to uh, you know, extract from the scriptures, but these lenses we put on are Gentile lenses. Mm, that's good. Instead of the context, mm. the context of scripture is first and foremost to the people that become Israel. Wow. And we have to remember our God who mm. was, is, and is to come. Jesus Christ himself, who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Our God, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of Israel. Right. He does not change. Right. And Jesus Christ, he came born in Bethlehem, which is in Israel. He was raised in Nazareth, which was in Israel, still is in Israel. He was ministered uh, throughout all of the regions of Israel, and the apex of his ministry is Jerusalem, Mm. which is the eternal capital of Israel, not because of of politics, but because of God's word, where God says Israel is... And Jerusalem is the apple of my eye. And he who touches Jerusalem touches literally the pupil of my eye. Oh, Mm, God, I don't want to be (laughs) the one to touch the pupil of God's eye because I can only imagine the righteous uh, indignation, Mm. um, the the, the holy wrath of God that would come against those that try to stand against Israel, against Jerusalem, against the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And um, again... Uh, My four to five minutes already ended, (laughs) but I would say Joel chapter three, Mm -hmm. which is an Old Testament prophetic book, Mm -hmm. but it's prophesying about the end times. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, depending on who you speak to and theologians take on it, it's definitely Joel chapter three, not something that's going to happen before the rapture. Mm. It's not even going to happen during the tribulation, depending on, you know, what your position is mm-hmm. on the rapture, pre-trib, uh, mid-trib or post-trib. Um, it's it's something that definitely is going to be happening after the second coming of Jesus Christ. And God the Father says he's going to call all the nations of the world, wow. all means all, right. to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which is mm-hmm. technically in between the um, Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount. Mm. And he is going to judge all of the nations of the world based on how they treated 
the land of Israel, mm -hmm. the nation of Israel, and the people of Israel. And I'll end with this. Wow. If we look at Matthew chapter 25, Jesus Christ himself, mm -hmm. he's also talking about a time when the son of man, when the king of glory is going to come back in all his power and all his glory with his angels. And he's also going to meet with all the nations. King Jesus is going to meet with all the nations and he's going to separate the nations as sheep nations and goat nations. Mm -hmm. And the sheep nations will be greatly blessed. The goat nations will be greatly judged. Wow. And the premise by which he's going to judge is based on how they treated his least of these, my brethren. Mm. And if you do a very in-depth study in the Greek, you're going to find out that he's not referring to the poor and needy. He's mm. technically referring to his own group of people, which is the Jewish people. And I'll wrap it. And the reason why he's going to do that yeah. in part is because of what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman in John chapter four, verse 22, when he says, you Samaritans don't know what you worship. Mm. We, referring to the right. Jews, we know who we worship, what we worship. He says, for salvation comes mm. from the Jews. Mm, I remember that. My Lord. Come on. Don't get me going, man. <laughs> <laughs> we could say, we could do a whole it. episode on that. We could. And it's so important, like you said. I mean, you have scripture to back it up. And I, and I love that. It's not Bible, your opinion. Bible, Bible. It's not anything. Because we've heard a lot of stuff. Well, that's Old Testament. Mm. You know, that, that's for the Jewish people. But mm. like you said, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's right. Jesus himself, who the American church, you know, we everyone looks to mm. Jesus, Jesus is like, you know, you know, he was Jewish. Mm -hmm. he That's was right. Jewish. And he still is. And he still is. And in fact, in the second coming of Christ, which is referenced in Zechariah chapter 12, um, and also in Revelations uh, chapter 1, they're going to look upon the one whom they have pierced. Okay, and they're wow. going to lament, which is now referencing not only the fact that Jesus Christ was crucified in mm -hmm. Jerusalem, but it is also referencing that when he comes back in the second coming of Christ after the rapture, whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, mm -hmm. whenever the tribulation ends, Jesus is coming back with his angels, with the saints, and he's coming back to planet Earth. He's not going to set foot on North America, Central America, mm. South America, the Caribbean. He's not going to set foot in Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe. He's going to set up his, he's going to set his foot on Israel's soil, mm. specifically in Jerusalem, more specifically in the Mount of Olives. Mm. And then he's going to split that valley, which, by the way, is the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Wow. That's where God is going to meet with all the nations. And he is going to split it to the north, south, east, and west. And he's going to come up the, uh, the Temple Mount. And he is going to reveal that he is King of Kings mm. and Lord of Lords. Why is he doing that? Because the God of Israel is faithful to his word mm. to Israel, not because Israel is perfect. Perfect, but because our God is perfect mm. in his word and in his grace. And in fact, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13, 13 says this. When God made a promise to Abraham, he said, because he could not find anyone or anything greater to swear by. God was giving an oath, a covenant. He said he swore by himself, mm. which means there is nothing that anyone, there is nothing that anything, whether it's Israel or not Israel, can do to change the covenant that God made that he swore by himself he yeah. would fulfill. So when Jesus comes back, he's not only coming back as Jew, as rabbi, as Messiah. He's coming back as the hope of Israel, yeah. fulfilling the promise of God, mm. the God of Israel, to save Israel. Well, that's good. And uh, man, I, I got to take a trip to Israel. You must. I got to go. It is transformative. It will change your life. My parents have gone, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if it's once or twice already, wow. but uh, they, they've been telling me to go. I So I, I most people know this that, that know me. I really don't like to fly. Okay. Uh, but man, I think I think I'm going to have to make an exception for it. that one. You must make I gotta the exception. Do it. I've been there five times. Five and times. each time, God has used that trip to impact my life in a distinct and a unique way. And the more times I go, it's kind of like puzzle pieces mm. come together to form the masterpiece. Mm. But this is not just any masterpiece. This is the master's piece Ooh. of our God of Israel and his commitment to Israel. And we as the body of Christ have to remember, God must be faithful to Israel mm. because he swore by himself he would be. And if we were ever to entertain the thought that he would break his covenant with Israel, then we have to be willing to 
except that God could break his covenant with the church. Mm, Now, that sounds anti-biblical, and Mm. it is, Mm. right? Mm. But I say that on purpose so that the Christian Gentile who would say God would never break his covenant with the church because he's faithful even when we're faithless. He remains faithful because he cannot deny himself, Mm -hmm. and I would agree. But I would say before God birthed the church, come Mm. on, in the New Testament, God... God brought forth covenant through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the people, their descendants, which become the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel, the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. He's the same God. Yeah. So if he's going to be faithful to the church, and he is, Mm -hmm. he must be faithful to Israel, and he is, and he will be. And so it shouldn't be a competition. It should be a completion. It shouldn't be a contradiction. It should be a compliment. It should not be a frustration of our theology. Mm. It should bring fulfillment and strength to our theology of knowing the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of Israel and Jesus Christ. He himself is the only begotten son of God who is also, remember what Jesus said, he first came to the lost house of Israel. Mm. And then he makes himself available for the nations of the world. Mm. But it all starts with Israel. And in terms of end times, it's going to culminate with Israel because Jesus is coming back to Israel. And guess what? If you don't physically ever go to Israel, Mm -hmm. we'll come back in the second coming of Christ because we're going to come for the millennial reign Mm -hmm. and we're going to be in the new Jerusalem and we're going to be with Jesus. So either way, we make it, but it'd be nice if you go before then. Yeah. I need that. I need that fear to go. You got to pray for some fear to leave me today. (laughs) Amen. Lord, (laughs) cast it out in Jesus' name. (laughs) We're going. (laughs) Amen. No, that's good. I appreciate that. And that's great insight. And I, like I said, I love, I love the scripture behind it too. And, Mm. you know, I'm sure whoever's watching right now, you know, if they have a question, yeah. or doubt about that, that must that might be silent now because that, that's some straight truth Come right on. there. And I love how yes. you said, you know, if if he has his covenant with Israel, I mean, that that's truth right there. That's if right. he's not going to break this and then, you know, with us, it's like that's solid truth, right? Yes. I don't think there's any argument over that. Yes. Uh, but, but man, we appreciate that, all, all that insight. And um, I know you've been busy. Speaking of traveling, you've been mm-hmm. busy, busy, busy. You guys yes. travel so much. Mm-hmm. Um before we kind of get it, I want to go into a little bit about Revival Now and everything Amen. you have there. But before we do that, we all know that the number one ministry is at home first, like they say. Absolutely. So how yes. do you balance that? Before we get into your book and everything, how do you balance the busyness, the life, the mm. you know ministry? It, it, can, it can get a little bit tough, and especially having yes. children at home. How do you balance that? That's a great question. And again... At least 45 minutes it would take to even kind of scratch the surface. Mm -hmm. So in like four, two, five minutes, I'll just give you a couple of highlights. Uh, First and foremost, I I would want to uh, say that um, I am not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, No human is. And so my wife and I, we have been learning a whole lot throughout the years. Uh, I mentioned that we've been married 25 years. We have our three children, ages 24, 22 and 20. Um, And we pretty much have been serving in ministry um, all the time that we have been married for the most part. And and so a lot of it we have learned uh, through the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, the beautiful, the horrific, and the terrific Mm. is a combination of all of that. And, uh, you know, in terms of of balance, um, I would just first and foremost say, the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has to be the center of our home, mm. has to be the center of our lives, has to be center of a marriage, has to be the center of our, our children's lives, and has to be the center of our home, uh, first and foremost. There's no way that we can have, you know, s- true balance and true success as a individual marriage and family without having the Lord as the foundation being the center of who we are. Uh, Secondly, uh, I would say that, um, you know, and and not everyone can say this. I, I am so blessed that I have my amazing wife. Mm. She, uh, some people will say behind every great man of God, there's a great woman of God. I disagree biblically speaking Mm. because in Genesis chapter two, when God saw Adam uh, alone and he said, it is not good for man to be alone. Mm. So he had him take a siesta, right? Take a nap. (laughs) And then he pulled out a rib from his side, from Mm. his side. So the rib, not from his back, not from his 
feet, mm. not from his head, right? It, it, it reveals that the, the women of God, that the helpmate is from the side. So mm. um, it's important to know that we need to have, uh, in my case, a, a wife that's by my side. Mm. Um, for a wife that might be listening to this podcast or watching it, you need to have a husband that's by your side. Yes. And um, the scriptures says one can put a thousand in the flight, referring mm. to when the Holy Spirit comes upon that individual, God can anoint them. Yes. They can do mighty and great things with the Lord on them, mm. right? But the scripture says, but two can put 10,000 in the flight. Yeah. So that's not even addition. Oh, no. That's not simple math. That's Mm-mm. exponential math, yes. right? So the exponential impact, exponential influence. And I, and I would say that w- one of the additional keys to having balance in the home uh, as a marriage and as a family is having a helpmate mm. that also uh, believes what you believe of God that also has made the Lord, his word, his spirit foundational in the home and that you team up together to parent your children, to influence, to lead, to direct. Uh, And then the other thing I would say, of course, is what the scripture says in the book of Proverbs, train up a child in the way that they should go so that when they grow older, they won't depart. And Mm -hmm. so one of the things that Mildred and I seek to do to make sure that we have balance in our home is that we are not trying to manipulate our kids to serve the Lord. Mm, That's good. We are not trying to force our hands on them uh, to serve the Lord. Yes, we coach them, we mentor them, uh, we provide an example for them, and uh, and we teach them, hey, mm-hmm. this is what worked for us. This is what worked for us when we were young adults, when we got you know, a little older, when we became adults that feel young. Mm-hmm. Amen. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and try to model it for them uh, so that they can see uh, how we uh, seek the Lord and pursue to have that balance. And then additionally, there, you know, the, from the practical standpoint, um, looking at the schedule. Mm. And and I, I would I would say that I'm probably uh, at fault the most in my home, <laughs> right? Uh, because as a minister, you know, you get running and gunning, so oh, to yeah. speak, right? Uh, but it's so important to establish a schedule, and especially depending on what the ages are in the home. When the, mm. when our children were younger, then of course we had to to even spend more time specifically doing um, the things that needed to be done as parents and as a family. Now Mm -hmm. our kids, they're 20, 22, 24. Our 24-year-old is already married. Gabriella Mm -hmm. is married to Jackson, so they have their own home. So so things change in the seasons uh, uh, of our lives. But balance is so important, and it's something that, number one, the Lord has got to be at the center and the foundation of. Number two, parents have got to work together as a team. Number three... They've got to um, train up their children in the way of the Lord and, and, and just training them up in the experiences that the parents have had. Number four, don't, don't, uh, you know, don't manipulate them. Lead by example. Mm. Be a model and uh, be intentional mm. um, and uh, learn, to, learn, learn along the way because yeah. it's not going to be perfect. But, uh, but if we're persistent, we can learn from it um, and be better for it. That's good. Yeah, and I love that you said that because, you know, me being a PK, you know, a pastor's mm-hmm. kid, you know, uh, my dad kind of had the same approach. And, you know, unfortunately, there are parents out there that are pastors and everything that maybe they, you know, maybe it's the way they were brought up or whatever, but it's it, it might be forced upon their children. Mm. And then, you know, it's that stereotype of like, oh, you're a PK, right. you know, you're a prodigal and everything. And yeah. and unfortunately, I've known a lot of PKs and they mm-hmm. went really off the deep end. Yes. And it's because, you know, what I've seen is they were really forced early on. Mm-hmm. So I love that you say that you give them kind of like you said the example um at least for my dad you know he gave us the example he you know hey it's your choice Mm -hmm. but at the same time he also tells us this is our this is our house and this is a godly house and my house will serve the lord yeah you know and you know i don't think you'd ever kick us out i don't know i never tried testing him that far (laughs) but uh, but yeah but even then you know it's like i've always known that kind of growing up it's Mm. like we need to respect this house good my brother and i so that's great yeah talk to us a little bit about revival now i know that's something Mm. that's fresh i know the last time you were with this uh you had your powerpoint we had everything going on there so talk Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
going back to the introduction, um, you know, you made mention that we were introduced by our dear great brother and friend Elias Flores, mm -hmm. and uh, he was the one that introduced me uh, to uh, your dad. And uh, during that time, I think it was January of maybe 2018, perhaps. Mm. And uh, I was ministering in several churches. I think it was during the month of January of that year, uh, ministering to churches here in the area, in the greater LA area. And uh, so Elias put me in contact uh, with your dad and, and your dad was gracious enough to allow me to come out and minister. I think it was a Thursday night. Yeah. And the very first message that I shared at your church was actually the introduction to this message of revival now. Awesome. And, and like I said uh, off camera before, I'll say it again. I think your church, without any exaggeration, has allowed me to share at least, I don't know, part five, part six, part seven, yeah. right, of this message revival now. Yeah. And so I'm so grateful for that. This message, it's called Revival Now. Last year in 2020, we wrote the book Revival Now. The subtitle was History is in the Making for the Next Great Awakening. Mm. And I believe that now more than ever before. Uh, but interestingly enough, that message uh, did not start in 2020. Mm. Um, and um, it actually had its, uh, its start in 2010 after I had gone through an 18-month season of a dark depression. Wow. Interestingly enough, it started shortly after I got on staff at Cornerstone Church, led by Pastor Dr. John Hagee and lead Pastor Matt Hagee, mm. Pastor Hagee's son. And of course, I love Pastors Hagee and I love Cornerstone Church and I love their pastoral staff. And this depression that I went through had nothing to do with them and in no way, shape or form is it intended to negatively reflect on the amazing pastors that the Hagee family and Cornerstone Church and their pastoral team have. And are and I, so many of my dear friends are still on staff there, and I love the Hagee family and consider them friends in the faith as well. But God just, um, well, I think in His sovereignty, He allowed me to go through one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, season of my life. Wow. Uh, it probably had something to do with the fact that um, at the time I was more prideful than I am now. Mm, that's it. <laughs> I don't know, you know, uh, if if if, if uh, this is uh, uh, readily accepted in, in in the church world to be vulnerable and transparent yeah. and broken and contrite. Yeah, we need more of it. Yeah, need more of it <laughs> but definitely. I think King David said something about a broken and a contrite mm. heart. God will not despise. Right, mm, that's true. and I think it was one of the prophets that says that God looks afar off on the proud, but He mm -hmm. draws near to the humble. So oh, yeah. I think it's better for me to walk in humility and just <laughs> you know uh, make it so I don't have to fake it instead of faking it because I haven't made it. There you go. And so I was dealing with a lot of pride issues in my own life, arrogant and cocky and all that other stuff, and mm. got on staff at the mega church, you mm. know. Cornerstone Church at that time had about 10,000 in yeah. average attendance on the weekend, 20,000 members, if not more, mm. ministry impacting the nations, the nations of the world. And I got to be the youth pastor for the high school youth ministry. So mm. I've arrived, so to speak, yeah. is what I thought, right? But Little did I know that um, God was going to allow me to go through a, a season where um, it started off with fears. Mm. Fears began to grow into doubts. Doubts began to grow into confusion. Confusion began to give way to anxiety. Anxiety mm. gave way to panic attacks. Wow. Panic attacks gave way to really a depressed state. Mm. Depressed state gave way to loss of appetite, loss of ability to really sleep well. Mm. Uh, all of that gave way to then having these weird... Um, physiological sensations all over my body wow. to the point where one night around one or two o'clock in the morning, I felt like I was having a heart attack. Wow. And I kid you not, I woke up my wife, Mildred, and said, you're going to have to take me to the ER. But I thank God for women wow. that pray. Yeah. I thank God for women that believe God's word. I thank God for women that trust the Lord. And I thank God for my wife. Mm. She's my super woman. Mm. Uh, she's my super wife. She's my super mom <laughs> to our children. She's my super co-minister in, in, in the gospel. And she tells me from time to time that she's super tired. <laughs> and, and I don't blame her. But so I do everything I can to, to bless her in a super way. <laughs> and um, 
And But what I came to realization is I was depressed. Mm. I think I should pray over me. The Lord helped me in that moment. But I, the depression did not stop then. I'd gone to a doctor's also to get some help, try to get on medication. Unsuccessful in my particular scenario because the church insurance, thankfully, did not cover the specific medications that were being uh, prescribed to me. Then I even went to a, a, a licensed Christian counselor oh. uh, who, instead of giving me a, a prescription, he gave me a scripture. <laughs> he gave me Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. Mm-hmm. Arise and shine for the light is coming. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Wow. Um, and then I began to, um, thankfully, uh, Pastor Matt Hagee, Pastor Hagee, uh, and the team there, once I began to share in vulnerability and, mm-hmm. and risk, mm-hmm. being open with them about the stuff that I was dealing with because I was pretty much hiding it for about nine months straight. I thank God they loved on me. They cared for me. Um, they, they, they were working with me. They, they were encouraging me. I began to go through even some, some um, times of um, uh, ministry of uh, reconciliation, ministry of encounters, ministry of uh, inner healing, ministry of deliverance. Wow. Oh, my. Wow. Do ministers need deliverance? <laughs> oh, my Lord. That's a whole topic right <laughs> That's there. That's a whole other topic. That's a whole topic. And uh, this was about nine months into it. And the next nine months to to equal the 18 months, God began just, I think he allowed me to kind of break down so he could build me back up. Mm. And of course, Satan is an opportunist, right? Oh, yeah. So whenever Satan sees our flaws and he sees, uh, you know, um, our disobedience, uh, he looks for a way to attack. Mm-hmm. And he certainly was. He was attacking my mind. He was attacking my, 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 my mindset, my, my attitude, my heart. Uh, he was he was attacking my my soul, my my will, my emotions. Mm. Uh, he was doing all of that, trying to destroy me. But I remembered uh, Philippians one six. He who began a good work is mm. faithful That's to it. complete it into the day of Christ Jesus. And I believe it was Paul that also told Timothy, even when we're faithless, God remains faithful mm. because he cannot deny himself. Towards the end of the eighteen months, the Lord said. I want you to come on a journey with me. Mm. I said, what are you talking about, Lord? He said, give me 40 days. 40 days of what? 40 days of seeking my face. How, Mm. Lord? And he said, you're going to fast. You're going to pray. You're going to get in my word. You're going to worship me. Mm. And then you're going to unite with the body of Christ. I call that the five rudiments for revival. Prayer, fasting, worship, the word, and uniting with the body of Jesus Christ. And Mm. so for 40 days, Mm. started the first 21 days with a Daniel fast. The next seven days with a liquid fast. The Mm. next three days with no food, no drink at all. Kind of like an Esther Mordecai fast. And then the rest, I think it was nine more days or so, went back on the Daniel fast. Mm. But I don't say that to glorify me or even the, what I call the rudiment of fasting. I'm just sharing, you know, the story, but God used those things of prayer, fasting, worship, the word and unity to help me understand that when we have gone through the thing that we feel is going to take us out, like Elijah, Elijah in first Kings chapter 18, he's calling fire down (laughs) from heaven, right? He's declaring now it's going to rain. It didn't rain for three and a half years. Now it's going to rain for the next three and a half years. He's outrunning King Ahab's horses and chariots. Yeah. He's living the supernatural life. But then yeah. in First Kings chapter 19, he isolates himself from his own servant. He mm-hmm. hears that, you know, Jezebel... He's out to get him. He, 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 he doesn't know what to do. He's on his own. He gets to the point of basically saying, I'm just going to die. Mm. And I, I don't know that, that, you know, we could say he had suicidal tendencies, but he certainly wanted to die. Yeah. He goes into the cave and we know the rest of the story. The Lord comes. Lord's not in the fire. Lord's not in the earthquake. Lord's not in the tornado. But the still small voice, mm. that prophetic whisper that says, Elijah. Yeah. Elijah, what are you doing? To get out of there. Get mm-hmm. out of that cave. And, and we know the rest of the story. But the Lord even utilized the life of Elijah with what I was going through. And he was telling me, I want to do something different with you. I, I mm-hmm. want to revive you. I wow. want to give you a revival. This depression has been trying to destroy you. But I want to bring you a personal revival mm-hmm. to restore you. Glory mm-hmm. to God. I want to encourage mm-hmm. somebody with that. Right? Depression will try to destroy you. But God wants to give you a revival that will restore you. Mm-hmm. 
and what I learn from the life of not Elijah, really, but the life of Peter, my namesake, right? In Spanish, <laughs> we would call him Mito Cayo. Yeah. And uh, Peter, you know, he also failed Jesus miserably. Oh, he yeah. denied him three times. He said he was going to go to prison for Jesus. He was going to go to, you know, to he was going to die for Jesus or die with Jesus. And then all of a sudden he's denying Jesus three times. The last time the book of Luke chapter 22 says that Jesus looked at him. Mm. Imagine that, well, that Peter denies Jesus the third time. And then Jesus looks at him yeah. and he says, oh, I yeah. dropped it. I messed up. Yeah. I, I'm done. Yeah. And, uh, but we see that in John chapter 21, Peter in the context of unity is restored. Mm. John and five other disciples say, hey, that's, that's him. Mm. That's him on the shore. And we know the rest of the story. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Okay, well then feed my uh, lambs. Peter, do you love me the second time? Yes, you know, I love you. Okay, well feed my sheep. Uh, take care of my sheep. Peter, do you love me the third time? Oh, yes, you know, I love you. Okay, well feed my sheep. Here's what was interesting. God began to revive Peter. So a personal revival would lead to a corporate revival. Wow, that's good. So Can revival, you say that one more time? Yes. That was good. God revived Peter yeah. so that a personal revival, which started with Peter, mm -hmm. would result in a corporate revival. Jeez. We know that after John 21, that's the last uh, chapter of the book of John, the next book is Acts. Mm. And we step in from John 21 to Acts 1, and who do we see? Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, appearing to his disciples over the course of 40 days, speaking to them of matters regarding the kingdom, not mm. man's religion. That's a whole another That's podcast good. segment, yeah. right? But regarding the kingdom, Jesus and his kingdom, and then he tells them, hey, guys, um, you're get ready. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit's coming. I'm sending the counselor. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But before you go, go and wait in Jerusalem. And if you remember, Jesus ascends. There are angels saying, what are you guys looking at? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the same way he went up, he's coming back. Oh, but yeah. you need to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promised Holy Spirit. Yeah. And Peter goes goes not with the 10 other disciples because there's Peter, there's 10. Of course, Judas, unfortunately, has self-sabotaged himself mm -hmm. and, and he had hung himself. But the scripture says later on in Acts 1 that there was a group of about 120. Mm. So now we see that what God did to Peter, God could do through Peter. Wow. Come on, so I got to say it again. Wow. What God did to Peter, he could do through Peter. Personal revival was becoming corporate revival. And it goes from Peter to the 10 to the 120 mm. and then Acts chapter 2 to the 3,000 yeah. and then Acts chapter Chapter four, the number grew to five thousand, mm -hmm. and they kept, and God began to add, and they multiplied to the point of Acts seventeen says that they were accused of having turned the whole world upside down. Wow, Check that out. Jesus first talked come about on. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. It's like saying, you know, um, Covina, mm -hmm. right? Um, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, Southern California, right? Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the world. Wow. Uh, and, and at this point in Acts chapter 17, the Lord is saying that he would move through the church to revolutionize the world. Mm, that's good. But it all started with yeah. Jesus giving a personal revival to a Peter. And then 2,000 years later, the Call exact somebody. same story to Peter and Jesus. Come wow. on. It, man, that's like, that's one of the best stories I've ever heard Glory right to God. Yeah, but, I, so that's what I happened, I do right? relate to that guy, Peter, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. But that's exactly your story. Mm, that's exactly yes. your story. So we received this message. Yeah. After the 40 days, uh, that was uh, the evening of February 28th through April 9th, which mm. this is amazing. I didn't know this going into this, but I later found out from our dear friend Lou Engel. Mm -hmm. uh, who came and ministered uh, for the young adults there at Cornerstone Church many years ago. I think it was the year 2013. Okay. And when I began to share my testimony with him, remember, you know, Revelation says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. It's right. so important for people, first and foremost, to receive the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us, that, that washes away all sins, that gives us new identity, that brings us into the family. We become sons of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And we become part of him. He is part of us. We are one with him. He is one with us. We become ambassadors of Christ here on earth, representatives of the kingdom of heaven here on earth so we can reach all mankind for Jesus Christ. And at the same time, 
the word of our testimony. Yeah. He's given you a testimony. He's given yeah. me a testimony so we can share this testimony uh, for many reasons. One is so that other people who are real can see that we're people who are real too. Mm, we all it. go through stuff, right? And secondly, so that people know that if God did it for us, God could do it for them. Mm, Come on, somebody. That blood of Jesus can work in anyone and everyone's life, regardless of who the person is and what the person has done. And then thirdly, so that when we have that victory, now we've got a message that God can use that is a confirmation of what God has already said in his word. Mm. So there's not a competing, it's completing, it's not a contradiction, it's a complementing, it's not frustration, it's a, a fulfillment of strength of, wow, our God really is real. He not just says it, he does it. Mm. And as we were going through those 40 days, I was attending a prayer uh, service on Friday nights. Mm. It would start at 10 p.m. at night and go through about one in the morning. Wow. Every Friday night, wow. it was led by two mighty women of God, Eileen Vincent and Natalie Hardy, who I thank God for uh, for many different reasons. In fact, they wrote the foreword of my mm. book, Revival Now, Histories in the Making uh, for the Next Great Awakening. And in one of the prayer nights, unbeknownst to, to what was happening. I was just praying and they kind of had an open night mic, mm. right? Um, uh, open night, open mic night. Open is mic what night, I meant yeah. to say, yeah. <laughs> and so I, it was my turn to get on the mic and just pray out whatever the Lord was giving me. And I'm praying and I'm praying. And all of a sudden I start declaring, give us revival now. Give mm. us revival now. We're believing for revival now. We declare revival now wow. and revival now, revival now, revival now. Interestingly enough, they were asking the Lord for the name of the conference they were going to have in June of the that year, 2010, wow. where they were going to have um, Chuck Pierce, where mm-hmm. they were going to have Hector Torres, where they were going to have other revivalists mm-hmm. that God uses throughout our nation and the nations of the world. Yeah. And um, the Lord spoke to them through that declaration mm-hmm. and said, that's the name, Revival wow. Now. And then to my surprise, they said, Peter, we want you to be one of the speakers. Mm-hmm. So here I go from wow. being in a season of 18 months of depression, yeah. right, to now, by God's grace and for his glory, be experiencing a personal revival that now is going to lead to a corporate revival. Mm. I get to minister at the same event where Chuck Pierce, Hector Torres, and other revivalists are ministering. Natalie Hardy, uh, Eileen Vincent are leading it. And that night that I ministered, it was a Saturday night uh, at uh, Abundant Life Church of God on the south side of San Antonio, Texas. And I love the fact that it was at the south side. Because <laughs> in San Antonio, the south side is the rough side. Is it? Come on, somebody. I remember, <laughs> Jesus was... He was raised in Nazareth, oh, right? Yeah. And yeah. they said, can anything good come Ooh. out of Nazareth? Yeah. Come on, somebody. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and we experienced a move of God on that night. It was June 2010 on a Saturday night. Great move of God. There was over easily over 600, if not more, mm. youth, young adults, and adults that felt young. Come wow. on, somebody. <laughs> there you go. And that was the beginning of the mm. revival now, the first wow. time I'd ever preached the message. And from there, I began to preach it all over Texas, all over the U.S., then into different parts of Central America, even Puerto Rico. Mm. And the more I preached it, the more God gave it to me. Mm. And this iPad you see in front of me has a lot of, you know, that preaching uh, in in an outline form. Mm. And it just would go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. The outline did. And then the Lord told me in 2019, December, mm. before the uh, the global pandemic became the global pandemic. We mm. know that supposedly it has this initiation in November mm. of 2019 in right. China, right? right? But in December, when I had no idea about it, the Lord says, now get ready wow. to write the book. And wow. I said, Lord, what are you talking about? I didn't know what he knew. He knows the end from the very beginning. I said, okay, Lord, well, I'll, uh, you know, I was working full time for Christians United for Israel at the time. So I was like, I'm going to have to take some time off to start writing this book. I'll do it during spring break of March 2020, mm. the second week wow. of that yeah. month. Well, you and I, we can think back to what happened on that second week of March of 2020. Mm. And we'll remember that's when the global pandemic yeah. began. Wow. And the Lord says, now write the book. Wow. And I said, Lord, what are you saying? And the Lord said, the, 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 the talking heads and the news outlets, mm-hmm. whether it's left or right, are right. all forecasting one similar thing. The next Great Depression could be soon approaching wow. our nation. Wow. And that the Great Depression that I believe took place somewhere around 1920s mm. of last century mm. seemed like it was going to be succeeded by even a greater next depression. Wow. But the Lord said, this nation and the nations of the world don't have to have their next 
great depression. Mm. They can experience their next great awakening. Wow, the grace. Second Jeez. Chronicles 714, if my people mm. who are called by my name will hum themselves and pray. Yes. Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. God says to King Solomon and to Israel, then will I hear from heaven. Mm. I'll forgive their sin. I'll heal their, heal their land. Yeah. We know that first and foremost to Israel, but also because of the body of Jesus Christ being grafted in, according to Romans chapter 11, through the blood of Jesus, through the broken body of Jesus, we now are participators. Yes. We are partakers of that covenant that God began with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for Israel and also now for the church. And so glory to God. Mm. I believe we're in that time. That's it. I believe the third great awakening for the United States of America is already underway. Mm. I believe it's happening not just in one city, not just in one county, and not just in one state, and not just in one region of the United States of America. This time, this third great awakening in our nation yeah. is happening in the body of Christ mm. all over our nation. Wow. And not only our nation, but the nations of the world. That's good. It's time. It's time. That's it. Where can, where can people, uh, like, uh, cause it's an amazing book. I know when you came, you know, you had copies for everybody mm -hmm. and everything. Where can people find that? Where can people get yeah, a copy of that? Thank you for asking our website, dejesusministries.com. Dejesusministries.com. They can order a copy in English there. They can order a copy in Spanish there. Uh, we'd love to dedicate it to them personally, sign it and send it off to them. We're really excited because very soon we're going to have it now in Portuguese. Really? It'll be called Avivamento Agora. Ooh. So it sounds similar to Avivamento yeah. Ahora, yeah. pero Avivamento Agora. So Lord willing, within the next month, uh, we'll have those copies available as well in Portuguese wow. and uh, make them available for those that speak Portuguese here in the U.S. and also in Brazil, yeah. uh, in Portugal, and who knows yeah. what's next. Uh, but we, we believe it's time for revival now. That's amazing. Well, thank you, Peter, man. We appreciate thank that. You. And we thank you for, for coming on. Before we do, though, I, I know we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, and um, on on Facebook a yeah. couple weeks ago, or okay. actually, no, no, back in August, I think it was, right? Or like June. No, June. It was in June. June. There yeah. we go. Um, <laughs> before I say this, though, before I go into it, I, I don't want to make this all, you know, I want to make this podcast all about this or mm -hmm. say this is where our church stands. But, you know, you were just talking about where we're at right now mm -hmm. at, in the world, where we're at in, you know, revival now. Mm -hmm. um, Everything that's that's taking place, you know, the whole vaccine talk is mm. huge right now, especially mm. in the Christian church yeah. right now. So divided, so much division, and uh, you know, I was on Facebook in, in June, and uh, and right away, you know, I, I was on there and I saw you. You know, you posted yeah. a picture of you, you know, getting your shot and everything. Yeah. And as soon as I saw that, I was just. Um, you know, and, and I myself don't have the vaccine, but I was just so happy. I was just mm. so happy because I was just like, I can respect someone so much whenever they do something mm. and they don't care necessarily about the repercussions, not in a bad way or anything mm -hmm. like that. But you were just so bold and posting it. I was thinking, man, there's so many people that especially Christians would mm. that especially would that would hate on something like that mm -hmm. and, and everything. And, but I, I kind of wanted to just bring that up. Like I said, you know, it's, uh, I know it's a hot topic right yeah. now and I'm not trying to go one way or the other, but mm -hmm. you know, you got the vaccine, yeah. uh, you're traveling still and everything. M maybe there's Christians that are out there that, mm. that want that feel like that's the best option for them that mm -hmm. want to get the vaccine but they're in a lot of fear or, you know, their church or their pastor or their leader, friends even in the church are so against it. You know, it's the mark of the beast. Mm. You know, you're living in fear, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, the, the, you know, the, the agenda right. and everything out there. What, what, first of all, kind of made you really, uh, you know, decide to do that without getting too personal, however, sure. however you want to get into it. And then uh, kind of what do you say about everyone? Just a lot of the, of the uh, negative uh, just uh, rhetoric that's out there right now. Yeah. Great question. And thank you for allowing me to answer uh, this question because I certainly think it's something that um, needs to be talked about. Uh, let me let me say one thing before I say this next thing. Uh, one, I am pro-life. Mm. I am against abortion. I believe that's murder. I want to say that. Yeah. <clears throat> next thing, as regarding the vaccine, there's a reason why I'm saying. <laughs> What I just said, I am pro-choice. Mm. That's good. I am pro-choice regarding the vaccine. Yeah. I am not pro-choice regarding abortion. Mm. I am pro-life, 
pro-life. I am against abortion. Mm. Vaccine, I'm pro-choice. Mm. Pro-choice. Why? Because the scriptures, specifically, I'm going to reference one. Romans chapter 14, I believe it is verse 23. Paul wraps up this chapter, Romans 14, that some study Bibles would have as a title, um, something along the lines of those who are strong and weak in the faith. Mm. And there's debate in that chapter. Paul is addressing the debate of some say, you know, you can eat this, you can't eat that. This one day is holy, all seven days are holy. And he says, look, you know, the reality is, is that the question is, what do you have faith for? Mm. What do you believe God through his word is speaking to you to depend on, confide in, rely on, and based on your faith in God and his word and what he's speaking to you, move. Whether it's I can eat this or I can't eat that. Right. Whether it's this day is more holy or all days are holy. Mm. And I love what he says at the end of this chapter. He says, so whether you eat or drink, mm. whatever you do outside of faith is sin. Wow. The opposite would be true. Whatever you do within the context of faith pleases him. Wow. And Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Mm. For one must believe that God is and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Mm. So the short answer to your question is, Mildred and I believed through God's word mm. that he wanted us to take the vaccine. Now, I'm explain why. Yeah. Because we were getting ready to launch De Jesus Ministries at a greater level than ever before. Mm, amen. And in order to obey the Great Commission mm -hmm. of Mark chapter 16 and preach the gospel to all creatures and the Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28 of making disciples of the nations, plural, nations, mm. it was going to require us to travel. Mm. And if we were going to travel yeah. uh, in a more easier manner or facilitate that travel at a faster pace, vaccine was the way to go. Mm. So it had nothing to do with Republicans or Democrats. It had nothing to do with the leftist agenda or the rightist agenda. Mm. It had nothing to do with politics or politicization of the vaccine. It simply had to do with the fact that if we were going to be able to fully obey God's call to travel freely throughout our nation and even the nations of the world, we were going to need to take that vaccine because I didn't want to have to jump through so many different hoops right. and go through so many tests and risk a false positive right. that would oh, yeah. keep us from That's being true. able to go from city to city, state to state, mm -hmm. region to region, and from this nation to wherever else the Lord wants us to go to preach Jesus and his kingdom. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, and like I said, I mean, we're, we're in an age right now where, you know, Christians won't even come to church if there's a mask, like much less the vaccine, mm -hmm. even just the mask. And, and I shared this a couple weeks ago. I was preaching here at the uh, at the warehouse and I said, um, you know, w w in regard just, just to the mask, I was mm -hmm. saying, you know, if, if you can't even worship or attend mm -hmm. a church just because you have a mask on your face, uh, I'd like to see you, uh, you know, worship God when, you ha when you're in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we look at we look at Paul, True. we look at Silas, you know, yes. worshiping in 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 prison, in mm. jail, no matter their situation, bound and everything, and and they start worshiping and breakthrough comes, you mm -hmm. know. And uh and, and that and that story just always moves me. But going yeah. back to it, it's like, you know, I love that you said that it's not just, you know, you're taking a ticket. And even if you did, that's your right and that's your choice. Because you're your pro choice. you're pro choice with the vaccine, with the like vaccine. you said. There you go. You gotta highlight that because <laughs> pro someone, life, someone might cut but that I'm up. Pro choice. And <laughs> Peter the Jesus is pro choice, you know what I mean? <laughs> they might cut that up. So pro-choice for the vaccine. For yes. the vaccine. Yes. But but th but that's so important. And, you know, like I said, I hope someone, you know, that, that's watching this will, will just have a little bit more uh, options now to choose. Yes. It's not just, you know, this is the way. And, mm. and it, like I said, the mark of the beast. There's so many things right. that we read and, and everything. Yeah. But I just I, I really just uh, congratulate you on that. Just Thank taking you. that, having that faith and that boldness to do it. Because, mm. um, you know, and I, I won't get into, to you know, and give them power, you know, if anyone sent you message or anything. But yeah. even if they didn't, I'm sure there must have been Christians that have saw, that probably saw that and were mm. taken back or, you know, kind of upset 
upset with that or anything. Mm. But like I said, it just meant a lot to me when I saw that because, like I said, you're Praise freeing God. other people now yeah. that maybe they feel like mm. they need to make that choice because mm-hmm. of whatever reason it is. Maybe it's their job. Maybe And like I said, the whole mm. fear thing. Can you kind of talk to that just for the next couple of minutes? Yeah. What, what, what do you say to that when it comes to fear, faith over fear? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, we see that a lot. If, if you have faith... You don't need to wear a mask. If you have faith, mm. you don't need the vaccine. You know, right. so how, how do you how do you kind of navigate that? The whole faith and fear. Yeah, that's a great question. And of course, you know, when you think about the fear, one of the passages of the scripture that a lot of people have been referring to in the past, you know, year, if not more, is if I'm not mistaken, Second Timothy chapter one, uh, somewhere around verse six and seven, and stir up the gift of God that you have received by the laying on of hands, for God has not given you a spirit of fear, mm. right, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so uh, we as the body of Christ, we're not supposed to give way to fear. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I know Jensen Franklin, Pastor Jensen Franklin wrote an amazing uh, book that addressed the fact uh, that there are at least 365 fear knots in the Bible. Mm. It's as if, you know, God in his sovereignty knew, well, there's 365 days in a year. So let me give you 365 fear knots, Mm, right? So that every day of your life, you know, we're not supposed to give way to fear. We're supposed to uh, give way to faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. So as a general statement, I would just say, you know, faith over fear. Yes, faith needs to be over fear. And the way we increase our faith over fear is by spending more time in God's word and not just reading it, but meditating on it, putting it in our mouth, speaking it, believing it, declaring it, even acting according to the word of faith and knowing that God will honor our faith and he will bless us for it. In terms, you know, of all the fear going on, whether it's the vaccine or whether it's anything else for that matter, just yeah. fear in general. The only type of fear that comes from God is the fear of the Lord. There it is. And that fear of the Lord is not the fear that a lot of people think of. Right. It is a reverence. Oh, yeah. It's being awestruck. Mm. It's beholding his wondrous mm. and saying, wow, you are awesome, God. Mm-hmm. And so that's the only kind of fear we're supposed to have. Yeah. Otherwise, we're supposed to have faith, yeah. right? And that fear of the Lord and anything else that contradicts Faith in God's word and being awestruck by God and reverencing God is not from God. Mm. So regardless of whether somebody is Hispanic like you and me or Mm. whether they're white or whether they're black or whether they're brown or whether they're yellow or whether they're red or they associate (laughs) with another, you know, color, regardless of whether they're male or female, regardless of what, if they don't know what gender they are, God help them, regardless of what, you know, political preference they have or social class they're part of or this, that, and the other that the enemy uses to divide our nation. Yes. We should not be giving way to fear. Yeah. Fear is not going to help us it, personally. Fear is not going to help a marriage. Fear is not going to help a family. Fear is not going to help a neighborhood, a community, a city, a county, a state, a nation, or the nations of the world. We as human beings that have been created in God's image and God's likeness, we who are Watch this. Fearfully and wonderfully made, according to the psalmist. Now, it doesn't mean we're made to have a lot of fear in us. (laughs) No, it means that we are reverentially made. Mm. God has made us for us to be in awe of him because he's really made us to be awesome beings in his image and in his likeness. We're called to realize who God is, who we are in him, and that we ought to live by faith Mm. in reverence to him and not give way to fear. And I'll wrap up by saying this, love casts out all fear. Mm. Love casts out all fear. That's not my opinion. That's a scripture. Amen. And so we need to focus more as we grow in faith, as we grow in awe and in reverence of God, recognize how much God loves us. God is love. And the more of his love we receive, more the fear has got to go. Amen. Because we know he's in control. He's a good God. He's Amen. a merciful God. He knows the end from the very beginning and from ancient times he declares those things that he's going to bring to pass. And in the midst of this mess, mm. he's about to bring a move of his Holy Spirit that's going to bless his people and use us to reach out to others that need to be blessed and be brought into the family of God.
Amen, amen. Well, you guys heard it first here. Peter de Jesus, thank you so much oh, for coming you. on. We thank appreciate you. you so much. Thank appreciate you so much it. of the insight and everything. Amen. I thank encourage you. you guys to leave a like on this video. Mm. Comment down below uh, your, your, your favorite part. Comment down below what you got. There was a lot of revelation there. Mm. I hope you guys received something. Again, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel. We have so many other amazing podcasts. And uh, again, Peter, thank you so much. Thank you for just thank being you. a Honored friend of the here. ministry. And I'm excited Absolutely. tonight. You're going to be uh, preaching here Come at the on. warehouse. So, Yes. guys we're gonna have that uh, preaching uh, uploaded on youtube so watch for mm. that video mm. and uh, and just stay tuned so we'll see you guys here yes. in the next episode thank you Take peter care. thank you brother